Hello friends and welcome. Today we're going to have the first of two talks on mesmer <laughs> mesmerism and next Sunday will be the second talk. The Washington area DC students at the Theosophy meet here at 4865 A Cordell Avenue, Suite 230, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, every Sunday at 11 o'clock. In the afternoon on the first and third Sundays, uh, we have roundtable discussions on a particular topic. I mean, this, this period's topic is the Bhagavad Gita and the notes to the Bhagavad Gita, and that was started about 12.30. Um, <coughs> we get together and discuss it with this uh, massive uh, philosophy which is the um, laws of nature. And then we work during the week, 24 hours a day, to assimilate this message, test it within our inner self. No one is asked to believe anything. We will uh, have a reading from the Declaration, which is this, the policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement, but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, the similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution, bylaws, nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis. And it aims to disseminate the idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. If regards to theosophists, all who are engaged in the true service of humanity, without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition, or organization, and is welcome to this association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect yet belongs to each and all. We're going to have a reading from the Dhammapada, followed by the talk and a question and answer period. Please come and join us uh, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area. The Enlightened Ones. By what track can you allure one who is enlightened? Trackless indeed is he. His victory now can undo. None of this world can touch that victory. He is a seer of limitless range. By what track can allure one who is enlightened? Trackless indeed is he. No net of desire can catch him. No craving can entangle him. He is a seer of limitless range. Even the devas, shining gods, aspire to emulate the enlightened wise who are great contemplators, who are the peaceful ones, who are steadfast and tranquil. Difficult it is to obtain birth as a human being. Difficult it is to live the life of a man. Difficult it is to get to hear the true law. Difficult it is to attain the enlightenment. Eschew all evil. Cultivate and establish thyself in good. Cleanse thy mind. 
so teach the Buddhas. Enduring patience is the highest tapas. Nirvana is the supreme state, so teach the Buddhas. He who oppresses another is no recluse. He who harms another is no ascetic. Revile not, harm not. Discipline thyself according to the law. Be moderate in eating. Dwell with solitude. Be devoted to higher thought. Such is the teaching of the Buddhas. Lost are never satisfied, not even by a shower of gold. He who knows that enjoyment of passion is short-lived and also is the womb of pain is a wise man. Even in celestial pleasures he finds no delight. The disciple of the supremely enlightened delights in the destruction of craving. Men dry, driven by fear seek refuge on mountains, in forests, under sacred trees, or at shrines. Such refuge is not secure. Such refuge is not the best. Such refuge frees not a man from pain. He who takes refuge in the enlightened one, in the law, in the order, perceives clearly the four noble truths, suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the noble eightfold path, treading, treading which all suffering is transcended. That, verily, is the safe refuge, the best refuge, in that refuge man is free from all pain. An exalted man is rare to find. Not anywhere is he born. Wherever a wise and noble one is born, that household prospers. Blessed is the birth of the Buddha. Blessed is the teaching of the good law. Blessed is concord in the order. Blessed is the austerity of those who live in concord. He who pays homage to those who are worthy of homage, be they the enlightened ones or their disciples. Those who have overcome the host of evil and crossed beyond the stream of sorrow. He who pays homage to the fearless and peaceful ones, his merit cannot be measured by any. Uh, today's talk in Anton Mesmer, uh, these individuals, these great souls who come before humanity have a message to deliver, but unfortunately for humanity, whenever they come, it is not perceived as such, so they really uh, are not very successful in divulging what they have brought with them because humanity fights it uh, tooth and nail. Paracelsus came for the 16th century. Uh, he was um, a great adept according to the secret doctrine. Anton Mesmer came for the 18th century. And we find that um, he was not really on his own. Uh, he had uh, help, uh, as we shall see. Uh, what we are talking today about is actually magic. But magic, in this philosophy, is not sorcery. It is a very exalted science. And it cannot really be considered uh, separately uh, from the main stem of magic, because what Mesmer brought uh, is called Mesmerism. Porphyry and Cicero described it as divine wisdom, and Plato associated this magic with the gods, these being but the occult powers and potencies of nature, 
and attributes of that unknown and nameless principle which he named deity. And this word is repeated in the secret doctrine and all of the theosophical writer, writings to differentiate it from God. It indicates that it is not limited, it is not humanized, it is not anthropomorphic in other words. So then magic is as old as men and the mention of it is in the oldest um, we have, which is the Vedas and the laws of Manu. Let me put it here. Yeah. And we see that um, in the um, Middle Ages it was carried through um, by individuals who were initiated into the uh, archaic knowledge. Uh, it was taught in the mystery schools of Greece, Neoplatonic, Neoplatonic school of Alexandria, and as we said, we saw Paracelsus in the 16th century, and now we're going to discuss Mesmer for the 18th. This magic is based upon the postulate that one vital principle is everywhere. One vital principle is everywhere. And of course, uh, the secret doctrine also names it as the one life of our solar system, one force underlying all the various forces of nature. So then mesmerism is one of the manifestations of this vital principle. And when human magnetism is directed by the will, it becomes mesmerism. So it is a law of nature, in other words. Magnetism is a part of that force. And the other um, brothers to magnetism are all listed uh, in the secret doctrine. Light, um, darkness, all of them are listed there. Uh, 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 electricity. Anton Mesmer is the, the rediscoverer of the practical uses of this very important branch of magic, was born on Lake Constance in 1734. At nine, he entered the monastery school, and at 15, he uh, won a scholarship at Dillingen. In his 18th year, he entered the University of Ingolstadt, where he studied the writings of Paracelsus and obtained a degree of Doctor of Philosophy. And then he studied law in Vienna, but he was really interested in the writings of Paracelsus. And so with that determination, he decided to become a doctor and took the study of medicine under Dr. Van Sweeten, one of the foremost uh, physicians of his day. In 1766, Mesmer received his medical degree and his thesis was based on the writings of Paracelsus and it was called the influence of the planet on the human body. In other words, he's showing the correlation of the uh, macro to the micro. Two years later, it is stated, he married a widow of 10 years his senior, and they built a beautiful house in Vienna uh, where the Rosicrucian activities uh, were taking place at that time. So he was, his uh, home was very large, um, uh, with uh, surrounding uh, gardens and he had a little theater in the garden because Dr. Mesmer was very fond of music and he played the piano and the cello with a skill. And so we find out that Haydn and uh, Mozart were daily visitors to um, Mesmer's home and uh, uh, they enjoyed tremendous uh, musical activities in that little uh, theater he had built uh, in his garden. And uh, when Mozart was 12, uh, he uh, submitted a uh, opera to the director of the Imperial Opera, but uh, his work was refused. So um, 
Dr. Mesmer took uh, pity on him and allowed Mozart to present his work in his little garden theater. And Mozart acknowledged this in his uh, opera that uh, is titled Cosi Fan Tut, Opera School for Lovers. Dr. Mesmer had a tremendously um, pleasant and smooth life um, for six years from 68 and 74 and we see him dividing his time between his musical friends and his philosophical and scientific study. In 1774 a distinguished visitor and her husband came to Vienna and the lady became very ill and uh, her husband uh, convinced uh, the famous astronomer Dr. Maximilian Heil to prepare a magnet for her and Mesmer followed this experiment with the magnet and so that it was tremendously beneficial to the sick lady who improved um, her health with the uh, treatment. So Mesmer decided to magnetize the water that his patients drank, bathed in, and their clothing and bedding. So he was using the magnet to bring about beneficent results. So news of these cures uh, spread like wildfire and within a year Dr. Mesmer's name was known all through, through Austria and we see the Bavarian Academy of Science inviting him to membership and the Osberg Academy officially reporting that Dr. Mesmer had discovered one of nature's most mysterious motive energies. Motive energies. In 1776, an important event occurred in Dr. Mesmer's life. One day, a stranger appeared at his door and introduced himself to Mesmer as Count de Saint Germain. And there are a lot of writings about Saint Germain in the literature. Uh, Dr. Mesmer asked him to come into his, into his study and said, you wish to speak to me on the subject of magnetism? And Saint Germain said, yes, I do. And uh, Mesmer then uh, acknowledged that he did not understand the higher powers of magnetism. Or magnetism. And Saint Germain said, that is the reason why I'm here, because I am, it is my duty to inform you. So then the conversation that took place in that study was lengthy one, hours, many hours, uh, two, three hours. And of course, uh, that was not the only thing they obviously discussed because they were both uh, representatives of the Theosophical movement at that time. What is not known about Dr. Mesmer is that his biographers always attend to his medical achievements, but his occult uh, side of his standing is not known. He was a mason and he was initiated member of two occult fraternities. fraternities. Um, one of them was called Fratris Lucis and the other one Brotherhood of Laxer. This one, the Brotherhood of Laxer, is the Egyptian branch of the Brotherhood of Lokshur in Belushtan, one of the oldest and most powerful of the Eastern fraternities. Under the order of the Great Brotherhood, which HPB of course was a member, the Council of Laxor selected Mesmer at that time as an 18th century pioneer uh, to present uh, Mesmerism uh, and also Cagliastro 
to uh, help with that effort. Uh, uh, Cagliostro to help, so? and of course, um, can you? Perhaps we should repeat it. Mesmer uh, was chosen as the representative of the of the Brotherhood, and um, Cagliastro was to help, and of course Count Sir Saint Germain was to supervise the events. So we will put these Cagliastro on here. See that uh, uh, there is three of them working for this effort in the 18th century: Cagliastro, Mesmer, Cagliastro, and Saint Germain. So from this day, uh, after he talked to uh, Saint Germain, his methodology changed. Before he was using the magnet itself uh, to bring about cures. From this day forward, uh, he's not using objects anymore, but he is using this vital transmission. Vital transmission and not the magnet anymore. Uh, and we find out that this magnet uh, that um, he's, uh, the um, force that he is using is called um, if a um, correlation of atoms on, on the metaphysical planes because it's a fluid that gets transferred uh, to the patient from the one who's extending it. Some people have the power, it is stated, to emit this fluid consciously through their eyes and fingertips and most of the healing miracles of history is based on this on this psychophysical power in man. We all have it, but it is not in use for most of us. It is just dormant. So we see uh, Mesmer's effort totally being concentrated now on healing the sick. All of his time is devoted to it. So his house uh, becomes um, a hospital and there's a stream of patients coming in and out all day long. Of course, his uh, fame grew among his patients, but not so with his colleagues. A physician who was using a physical magnet was acceptable to the uh, uh, physician uh, physicians of the day, but that once he changed that into a direct invisible fluid transmission, everything uh, went uh, sour for him from that uh, department. Uh, after Dr. Mesmer restored the sight of a young girl who had been blind from childhood, the president of the medical council appealed to the Empress of Austria to put an end to this humbug. So he is now um, considered an imposter after this uh, scenario and he leaves Vienna and goes to Paris in 1778. At first this move seems um, favorable. Marie Antoinette promised him her patronage and many of the Austrian nobility came to him as patients. But the academies of science and medicine to whom he immediately addressed himself refused to respect his theories. So in 1779, Dr. Mesmer published his French report on animal magnetism, 
declaring that it is not a secret remedy, but scientific fact whose causes and effects can be studied. And he frankly admitted that he wished to gain support from the government, some government who was courageous enough to look into this field at that time and inaugurate a house where the sick could be treated and the magnetism could be studied in its full force. The publication of this report, of course, caused a tremendous sensation. The clergy attributed his tremendous cures to the devil. The orthodox physicians denounced him as a charlatan, but the aristocracy of Paris uh, were excited to the verge of madness by his phenomenal cures. Dr. Deslon, physician to Comte d'Artois, promptly rallied to his support. A lady in waiting uh, to the Queen, who had been cured of paralysis, appealed to the Queen for her public recognition of Dr. Mesmer's methods. The Princess de Lamballe and Dr. Bourbon, the Prince de Conde, and the idol of the day, the young Marquis de Lafayette, all gave him their ardent patronage. So at the Queen's request, the government entered into direct communication with Dr. Mesmer in order to keep him in France, and uh, the King's minister offered him a pension. So from 80, 1780 to 1784, Dr. Mesmer was there in Paris. He took a house in Place Vendôme. And when that became too small for his patients, he also um, accommodated himself um, by assuming uh, to make a hospital of Hotel Bouillon in the Rue Montmartre, where he treated the poor free of charge. But here is the problem. The queen goes along with Mesmer and supports him, but the king uh, is not so sure as to what exactly is going on. So. He asked the academies of science and medicine uh, to do a study to determine exactly what it was that Mesmer was doing to bring this uh, cure about. On this committee then is Benjamin Franklin, Bailey the astronomer, Lavoisier the discoverer of oxygen, and the celebrated botanist Josep. The French Academy of course at that time was enjoying a tremendous popularity and uh, it was like a uh, characteristic of an adolescent. So what was the merit in treatments which savants could not understand? Committee did their study and handed to the king on uh, August 11, 1784 uh, a report and the members of the committee honestly admitted the efficacy of Dr. Mesmer's cures because he did cure a lot of people. Some power was at work, they claim, but what was it, they could not say, because nothing could be perceived by the physical senses. Therefore, they con their conclusion was, where nothing is to be seen, felt, tasted, or smelled, there is nothing that can exist. So, this was due to the imagination of the patients, they said, that the cures were brought about, that Mesmer was not doing anything, in other words. Therefore, to proceed with these methods in the presence of others cannot fail in the long run to be unwholesome, was how the report ended. So here we see him again in 1784, denounced as an imposter by the French, as he was uh, denounced in Austria, few years back. And we see that um, at the Masonic Convention in Paris, um, Cagliastro, um, Saint Germain, um, Mesmer and um, Saint Martin meet and they conclude that his effort to be recognized uh, or to have magnetism recognized is a failure. And their focus shifts to England um, because um, the Bhagavad Gita had just been translated by Wilkins in, in London for the first time 
and uh, also uh, Thomas Paine was preparing to go to England uh, with some of his inventions at that time. Um, so they decided to focus on the English shores and left Mesmer to his own devices. So the storm that had uh, taken over his life uh, through this um, report uh, was forgotten very quickly because in 1791 uh, France got engulfed in uh, a revolution as we know and his friends all found themselves worrying their own heads or keeping their heads uh, at that time. He was not a French citizen, uh, Dr. Mesmer, and he finds himself all by himself at this period. So he left Paris and went to uh, Fraunfeld, which is a little village uh, about 20 miles from Zurich. And he continued with his research work and gave treatments to his humble peasant neighbors and um, never spoke to them about what happened in the past um, or his reversals of fortune. Uh, he maintained an attitude of patience and resignation. And of course, we know that that is a common attitude uh, of all agents of the Theosophical Movement because when they are sent into the world, they know beforehand what awaits them. In 1803, Dr. Mesmer was invited to return to Paris and in 1812, letters from Germany assured him that the King of Prussia, the German Academy and the German people were prepared to give him honor, which France had denied him. But both of these invitations he refused. All that he wanted was a place where he could carry on his work and make it permanently useful to those who would follow him. He went to Miesburg, a little village near where he was born, and in spite of his 80 years, he continued to work among the poor. A pleasant respite from all of his labors uh, each week uh, ended with a uh, concert at the place of Prince Dalberg, which he never missed to attend. On the morning of 1815, March 15, a young musician of his acquaintance came to call upon him and Dr. Mesmer showed his young friend a set of musical glasses which always accompanied him on his travels and which were copies of the musical glasses made by Athanasius Kircher in the 16th century by which Kircher tried to cure disease with the power of sound. So Dr. Mesmer stroked his glasses with loving fingers and said Mozart and Haydn always played on them when they came to see me in Lenstrasse. Mozart was so impressed with them that he composed a special quintet for them. And he led his young friend to the piano and said, play something for me, my son. I am very weary. Softly, the opening theme of Mozart, a major sonata, started to tinkle from the keys. The old man's eyes closed, his hands relaxed, and on the gentle stream of that soft flowing music, the great soul of Anton Mesmer went to its own place. During his life, of course, his doctrines um, were not really appreciated, even though he brought about tremendous cure. And if we read Capiastro's um, uh, efforts uh, in that department, we see that he was also curing a lot of people. But that's a different subject, of course. But through Lavater, Persiger, and Deleuze, this effort continued and uh, the German government and the Royal Society of Paris offered a prize of 300 ducats for the best treatise on mesmerism. And again we see in 1830-46 to 46, public notice through experiments of Baron du Potet and later uh, he became an honorary member of the Theosophical Society and was described by HBV as the greatest adept of mesmerism in this century. Of course, science denounced mesmerism, but it plunged headlong into hypnotism, which differs, it says, from mesmerism as black differs from white. So mm -hmm. now, here is mesmerism, which is bringing tremendous cure everywhere, and science 
because it cannot test it with physical senses, denies it, but gives it the name of hypnotism and accepts it. And now we'll see what the difference is. Hypnotism, in hypnotism, the operator paralyzes the channel in the brain through which the subject or ego operates and controls that organ. So, does science acknowledge an ego? This action prevents the subject from receiving any other impressions than those suggested by the operator. This practice has always been named black magic by the true adepts because it is an interference with the free will of the ego. So, in hypnotism, there is this um, interference with the free will, will of ego. And it is denounced, it is called black magic. Any person, therefore, who practices hypnotism is well on the road to becoming a black magician. Hypnotism acts upon the capillary veins and nerves from without, and it is a repression. But in mesmerism, the case is reversed. Here, the effect is produced from within without and opening up instead of repression and contraction. In mesmerism, the operator does not interfere with the free will of his patient and the subject continues to move in accordance with his own nature and qualities. So the present experiments in hypnotism, which are becoming more prevalent every day, are considered the most dangerous of practices. The action and reaction of ideas on the lower inner ego are not yet understood for the simple reason that the ego itself is an unexplored field for scientific work. When physicians begin to study the complex nature of man and discover the occult axiom that the will of men must not be controlled by another, then they will really start um, studying, I think I removed the word magic, what magic is. Because without knowing the sevenfold nature of man, um, this philosophy cannot be truly understood. So, in our next presentation, uh, that side of the philosophy will be discussed as to where these powers reside, what affects it, and if we don't know where it is, how can we possibly learn to um, control it? for ourselves, because each man is the uh, power uh, for himself, because um, we all have it. We have all that uh, fluid that the secret doctrine talks about, uh, which is transmitted uh, during uh, that uh, energy transference where the cure takes place. It's a direct transfer from one person to the other. Um, so we will now open it for discussion and if you have any questions. Yeah. Out of curiosity, um, <clears throat> hypnosis uh, tends, from what I've seen in, in, in pop culture, it usually involves the, hypno the hypnotist using a, 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 the finger or something, a, a pencil, a clock, a stone, some, a stone, something to then get the person in to, to immerse in a in an altered state of consciousness, if you will. Uh, I'm curious, what are the techniques uh, or a sample, uh, an idea about what are the techniques for involving mesmerism? Well, we just talked about it. It's a direct transport of magnetism, but when it becomes uh, between two human beings, then it becomes, it, it is called animal magnetism because it is not an object that is transferring the uh, needed fluid. 
we just read uh, from this uh, from the writings. This is collected from the writings. Let us revisit it. Yeah. And here is what hypnotism does. In hypnotism, the operator paralyzes that channel in the brain through which the subject, ego, operates and controls that organ. The organ is the brain. What is the brain? The brain is the tool that the mind uses. Who's behind the mind? The ego. So that channel is paralyzed. In whose control are you left when that happens? Because it's severed, in other words. But paralysis means that power is severed. So under whose control would you then become? Uh, someone is controlling you because you're, uh, you're asleep. You're, you don't know what's going on. Then you become uh, controlled by the, mes by the uh, hypnotizer. You're under their total control. And the ego who uses these um, channels to obtain information from the universe is not there. It that cannot control anything. So you are left at the mercy of the hypnotizer. And this is why they're against it. That your free will ought not to be uh, controlled or interfered with. Now, we'll go to the other one. Put it here. Okay. Dr. Mesmer used a magnet at first, a magnet, and he magnetized the water that the patients used, their clothing, their bedding, sheets and everything, and he brought about tremendous success in healing people. After meeting Saint Germain, let me just finish this and then I'll answer you. After meeting Saint Germain, his methodology changed. It became direct. And what is he directly transferring? A fluid, which is a molecular constitution on higher planes of being. Uh, it's either the fourth or the fifth level, uh, I believe, this fluid comes from. What's, what's the fifth level? Your mind, right? right? The higher mind field. Okay, so he has, through the teaching of Saint Germain, this knowledge was passed on to him. And he wanted a government agency to, to look into it. But he was considered a charlatan because you couldn't touch the fluid with your fingers. You couldn't perceive it, in other words. Okay, that's the difference between this methodology and the other one. This is from inside out. It opens your channels for receiving what is being sent. The other one is from outside in because it's control. Your free will is not there. Whereas with mesmerism, it is still there. The ego can do whatever it wants to do with what is coming in. It can accept it or refuse it, right? So, you said it usually comes out of the eyes or the fingertips? Correct. So there's actually liquid? No. It's, what is your inner self composed of? Are you not electromagnetic? So it's energy. energy? It's electromagnetic and it has a very ethereal constitution. But nevertheless, it's substance since you can transfer it, is it not? It's a very refined substance, but it its molecular constitution is electromagnetic. So, okay, back to Lenning's question. How would, if somebody was being healed by mesmerism, what would it look like? Well, uh, your disease process is stopped because this fluid obviously... Uh, but, but would mesmer just look at them or touch them? I don't think you have to touch them. You can bring about healing from six feet, six to eight feet uh, distance, it says. So I don't think you have to physically touch them. 
he you went, can transfer it he, from six feet away. Okay. But it does not specify. But with the magnet that when he was using, this student's question was, how does that bring uh, healing? Mm, this student's question to myself was, how is he bringing this uh, magnetic uh, healing? And what occurred to my mind is that there has to be some polarity changes uh, because uh, as the disease processes uh, go on, apparently the pH of the body changes, the pH. Uh, in cancer, this is a true statement. The, in our words, we become acidic. Uh, cancer patients are more acidic than other patients and the pH becomes uh, significant. In other words, you have to make it um, alkaline for the disease process to go away. Uh, in these, uh, they don't exactly tell you because they don't want you to go out and try it, obviously, until you become proficient. Now, Saint Germain is an adept. The adept taught him what to do. Uh, it, it must not be an easy feat to achieve by yourself because uh, we don't even know how to work on the astral plane and this is coming from the fourth or fifth plane uh, far above in uh, refinement uh, where its molecular constitution is concerned so, but you so are nevertheless transferring a fluid is what they are calling it because they can't call it anything else but its constitution is electromagnetic and very refined very ethereal and not visible to this eye what would you need to see it with your inner eye has to be active, does it not? Inner eye. So would he, would Mesmer um, transfer the energy to the magnet itself? He was tra tra transferring his own fluid to the patient. But what about the magnet? The, the magnet fun. was put in, uh, he was magnetizing the water and uh, the clothes they were wearing and the sheets they were sleeping on and so forth. And my question is, how does that change the constitution of those things? What would happen? Uh, we can experiment with that, you know, ourselves. Because but, but magnet that, is available to us too. But, That's so all he was using. The magnet came with its own properties? He didn't yes, transfer on, them? Mm -hmm. The magnet comes with its own properties. But how do you use it to magnetize your clothes, for instance? Because there has to... Uh, come about some change and what is the change and how did he achieve it? It is not explained. Your inner eye has to be open. What is the inner eye called? The secret doctrine has about 10-12 um, pages on this subject. It's the pineal gland. Pineal gland. This we had open in the fourth race. We are now fifth sub of the fifth race, and it has been closed since that time when we abuse that power because it's a spiritual. This is a spiritual power. What can you use it for? Healing others, obviously. It's not something you use it for yourself, even. HPP had leg problem and she carried that problem all her life with her and no one should uh, think that she didn't know how to cure it. She did. But you can't use that power for yourself. You have to use it for the benefit of the other. So the fluid is electromagnetic obviously. That's your astral body, is it not? Your astral body is, is made up of ethereal sub astral substance and obviously it, it has seven levels and it comes from its higher constitution is what this student is thinking about. Uh, it's not written as I said that they don't explain it because they don't want to give the secrets of the uh, um, mode of transfer to us, to ordinary people who don't know what they are doing. We can, because I think that power can easily as kill as give life to other people. Yes. Go ahead. In um, the documentary, what they believe do we know 
uh, uh, that was screened for by the ULT 14 years ago. There, I recall, there is a, a researcher from Japan. I think the name by the last name Emoto that talks about uh, has something called messages in the water. He talks about how uh, the the level of energy exchange between people is reflected <laughs> in water. Oh, that, your thoughts are reflected yeah, in water. Yeah, I read that experiment. If there is, it changes color and uh, its constitution alters with your thinking even. Yes. Yeah, we don't know about it, but um, yeah, I read that experiment. Mm -hmm. And what is your? Who who that? And I was gonna bring also healing, uh, like energy healing techniques like Reiki in, in the East, who could those approaches, the, the, the dynamics that are happening in the water, according to Emoto and Reiki and those kind of healings, may be related to Mesmer and Mesmerism? Uh, you have to remember, this comes from the higher aspect of this force. Those, Reiki and others, are psychological. In other words, they are on the psychic plane. What's the difference? The psychic plane deals with the lower mind, not the higher mind. There is a difference. Uh, the lower mind, <laughs> there's only one mind. It's just, it, it functions in this way, lower and higher. And this is not to um, mistake that our mind is divided into two. It's the personal choice that the individual exercises that makes it go up or down. The lower it goes down, the higher pulls you towards what? The higher trinity, your buddhic soul aspect of life. And that's where the truth lies, is in buddhi. Buddhi is the vehicle of Atman, which is a spirit. And that is not the uh, power using in Reiki. It's this one here. It's the lower astral you're using. It's not the same force. It, it, it is forced, but it's it's lower aspect, and it can cause damage as well as uh, whatever else it does. As a student does not know, it does not get involved in any of those fields. I know them, I read about them, but I don't get involved in them because I know they're dangerous. And your question? I'm, I'm hearing the association between science and mesmerism. And while the, while science has a great value, uh, uh, Secret Doctrine talks about that, it shies away, you know what, for example, the pineal gland is. It can show you in, the brain, in your brain exactly where it's at and so forth. But it doesn't recognize what it does because it stays away from spiritualism in general. We say so that, that the whole higher aspect is foreign to modern science. Right? It's correct. It's correct. Because this is related to the sevenfold constitution of man. And if you don't acknowledge the uh, existence of that, then how on earth are you going to know uh, where it resides and what it is? Now, some of the intuitive scientists uh, in studying the atom and in studying the atom have come to the conclusion that that um, force trajectory that it follows uh, at one point disappears and they don't know what happens to it, the atom. And they are now looking into um, meditative uh, forms to see what it is that one can perceive through meditation with Dalai Lama. Some of them are working with the Dalai Lama. And uh, Dalai Lama says, well, <laughs> I'm not convinced yet, but maybe in the future I shall become convinced. Because Dalai Lama obviously can function on all of these levels uh, consciously. However, until HPB says science accept the astral medium, which is the astral light we talk about a whole lot, and start to experiment with it, they will not know these truths 
because you cannot see it with your physical eyes. The astral world requires the development of that inner eye. What does that development mean? Psychism, it is not. Developing your psychic powers is not what they are getting at. How do you develop it? By the parameters, exercise of the parameters. This is divine wisdom. And how are we going to get to divine wisdom if we do not practice love and charity and kindness to others? That's the first rule. And um, the first rule of the secret doctrine, the first um, fundamental is based on unity of all nature. Good, bad, and indifferent, we're all in the same part. All of it. All of us. Not just us as humanity, but all of the other kingdoms. Three lower elemental kingdoms, the um, vegetable, animal kingdom, and of course the spiritual kingdom of humanity is also included. So we have tremendous responsibility in this direction. So until, um, when do you think science will actually accept it? She tells us, <laughs> she says that when they have no choice, but when it becomes visible in the air, then that is good when they're going to accept it. But she doesn't say how we're going to perceive it in the air. But she does tell us other things in that secret doctrine. And the other thing is that, which we will discuss next week in detail, but the other thing is that we're going to etherealize. So does that mean if we do not go in this direction, we won't be able to uh, continue with the uh, evolutionary process and we will look into it in the next discussion because we're going to discuss the correlations uh, of this talk to our constitution, uh, where it resides, uh, how we can uh, develop our higher nature and so forth. So it is important to understand who and what we are <laughs> because the axiom is men know thyself. When, the, when you get to know who you are, then you also know the correlations of the greater uh, universe around us because we're just like it, just a miniature copy. All of these uh, constitutional uh, of men, all of the uh, different levels of that constitution have its correlation with the universe we live in. So these powers are not personal, they are universal, you, and the energy is ubiquitous, it's everywhere and in everything. She says, uh, a blade of grass and a god develop in the same manner. Self-induced, self-devised effort. And when you look at the blade of grass, you don't think that uh, that applies to it. But it's the same energy that uh, sustains the blade of grass as well as us. It's everywhere, in the air. We just don't know it, we don't see it, but it's there. Uh, the Indians call it Jivatma. So Atman is our highest uh, principle of spirit. So they're saying Jiva has Atman in it. In other words, the spirit is not missing from any spot in the universe and neither substance is missing anywhere. Uh, secret doctrine tells us substance is never created. It always is. The primordial substance is always is. So to my mind, when you're going closer and closer to the primordial substance, that's when I think all these uh, curative properties come into being because it's so close to the root, it has that power to heal. And each one of us have that power. So, you probably get into this next week, but the uh, astro, then we have the Akashic, it sounds to me like we, in our current stage of development, while we can learn a lot by dealing with the lower aspects, as above, so below, uh, until we acknowledge the astral, like you said, and, and then the acoustic after that. Um, uh, astral is the lowest the level okay. of Akasha. Yeah, we should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll do it here. You go, okay. Mr. Four. All right. Yeah. Uh, she talks about Akasha quite a bit in the secret doctrine. Uh, it's sometimes spelled this way, and sometimes it has an H in it, 
and uh, this is the secret doctor in my Akasha and the astral is the uh, lowest of Akasha so astral world or astral light is the seventh level of Akasha but not the highest the lowest and she tells us in the secret doctrine that it is so close to substance our material world that it is polluted we pollute it humanity pollutes the astral light and she says it reflects what we put into it so it's polluted polluted Polluted. Yep, polluted. We pollute it. She says that it is uh, quite um, clear and uh, beneficent, but since it stores all our thoughts, all our deeds in it, then it reflects what we put in it. So she says we find it pure, but when we return it, it is not pure. We have polluted it. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, please join us uh, next week.